My name is John Downey. I'm Professor of Comparative Media Analysis at Loughborough University. Um, and as part of our activities at the Institute of Advanced Study, um, we are holding uh, a series of conversations. And our latest guest is Gian Petro Mazzolini, who's Professor of Political Communication at the University of Milan. Gian Petro, um, you've recently retired from um, the University of Milan, a long and illustrious career. I'd like to spend um, a few minutes of the interview just talking about your intellectual biography. So for example, um, I was very interested to see that your first degree as an undergraduate was actually at an American college. Could you talk a little bit about why you went to study in the States and wh what you found out there and your experiences? Yeah, that was long ago, by the way, <laughs> the late 60s. Uh, in those 60s in America, there were a lot of things going on. The war in Vietnam was still uh, in, in going on and the, um, the students were rioting in uh, the universities. So uh, the, the atmosphere, the political atmosphere was quite uh, nervous, so to speak. And uh, when I uh, went to study sociology, which was a, a kind of a weird subject for Italy and for Italian students, so uh, winning a purse uh, from the Employers Association, uh, I could uh, attend an American college uh, and study sociology with the idea to return and work in uh, their industrial relations departments. Uh, what happened is that I didn't have any idea of what, myself, I didn't have any idea of what was sociology about, and so I had to learn from scratch, and I fell in love with sociology, so to speak. And, um, and then I also performed fairly well. I was in, on the dean's list, something unusual for the Italian, uh, for a foreign student going to America. So that encouraged me to, to, to engage more in, in studying uh, society. Of course, in, in, in that case, I was right in the middle of uh, American society with all the problems that I mentioned. So I tuned in with the climate of opinion of the times. Um, and that uh, and, and opened up also my attention for uh, uh, politics uh, and for the media. Um, and so from that moment on, I abandoned the idea to return to a job uh, in, in the industry. And I, from that moment on, after my graduation, I pursued uh, a university career, a research career. Mm -hmm. And I understand that you started writing about political communication while you were an undergraduate. Yes, in the States. Uh, yeah, that, that's something uh, I just found in my uh, boxes that I still have in my um, in my at my home. Um, a, a paper, a position paper that I had to write for English composition class. And I remember uh, to have written a paper with the title um, A New Wave of Conservatism in American Politics. And uh, that explained in a way, uh, to some extent at least, uh, why Nixon had won in 1968. By the way, I had a chance to listened to Nixon in college when he came to, you know, during the campaign, I was in New Hampshire, and uh, I could uh, listen to his uh, rhetoric, uh, and I got to know him, not personally, of course, but, you know, uh, from the accounts of the media, and uh, I remember how, uh, how he was uh, nicknamed, uh, the Tricky Dick, <laughs> which was kind of funny for me, but, uh, so, um, then, you know, there was, um, the idea that America was going towards a, a chaos, towards a illegal uh, mass behavior because of the riots, because of students for democratic society, because of the Vietnam War, the, the, the fact, the draft uh, movement of, of people, of uh, future soldiers moving to, uh, uh, to um, Canada to escape the draft. 
So he presented himself in a populist way, we might say. You know, in those days, nobody mm. spoke about populism. Uh, in a populist way, saying that uh, we need to go back to law and order. And th that was uh, the slogan of his campaign in 1968. And he, and he by the way, he, he won with a landslide in 1968. Mm. Mm. So looking, looking back over your career, I, I guess um, one of the concepts um, that you're known for writing about um, is the concept of mediatization. And this is possibly the biggest concept, biggest buzzword in contemporary communication studies. And it's probably fair to say that you were one of the first people to use the concept. And I think if you look at your early work from the, or at least your early work in English, published in English from the early 80s, you already see there the development, I think, of the concept of mediatization around uh, the notion of media logic. Um, could you j just talk a little bit yeah. about media logic mm. and, and how, how you started thinking about that? Yeah, that came long after uh, the, my experience, my American experience, you know. Mm. The, my American experience was, um, you know, it was education to sociology. Uh, uh, and when I returned back uh, to Italy, I got my doctorate from the University of Rome in uh, sociology of communication. Mm. And uh, my thesis was about the, um, the effects, effects of the media on uh, voting behavior. It was rather an analysis of the literature because I couldn't afford to make any uh, personal uh, research, empirical research, and in those days nobody was interested very much in, in that because of the Italian situation, the political situation is, you know, I'm speaking about the, the early 70s, um, it was completely different from the Berlusconi years, for instance, that would come 10 years later. Anyway, together with Paolo Mancini, who is also very well known in, in the literature, in the academic literature about the media and politics, and uh, Giorgio Grossi from uh, the University of Torino, uh, we put together our forces to study you know, how the media um, intervened into the, uh, the, the election campaigns in Italy, because we noticed that something was changing um, compared to what has been what had been for so long in Italy, you know, mm. boring campaigns or mm. highly ideological campaigns, politics over anything else. Mm. Mm. Now the media were, in a way, um, uh, saying their own uh, word, um, not necessarily uh, through journalism, but uh, like in this case, in our case at least, was the, the turn towards a commercialization of the television system, which was, by the way, uh, unregulated. So everybody could put up a, a commercial television, local television, and, uh, and the politicians started to use uh, local televisions to, to, to make you know, commercials you know, for, for their campaign. So that was absolutely something new that we thought deserved to be uh, investigated. So we did a good study uh, with the campaign of 1983 uh, that we thought it was the first uh, mediatized campaign in a way. We did use uh, that word and we relied on, you know, to elaborate on the concept of mediatization on the, we, lied, or we, drawn, we, we drew on uh, um, the, the work by Altid and Snow media logic, uh, we found very, we found their work were very um, insightful. So we tried to apply, you know, what was meant by media logic to uh, what was changing in, uh, in the uh, media system in Italy vis-a-vis uh, -vis politics. And so that's uh, the moment when uh, we started to use uh, mediatization. And then I published later with uh, uh, Winfried Schulz but it was already a, a, a reflection on uh, not only on the Italian situation, but also comparatively speaking, looking around at least Europe, but not only Europe, you know, mediatization, even though the Americans don't love the word, 
Uh, it was already something established in, in, in American politics, you know. Mm. You look at the, uh, the way uh, the politicians are uh, uh, dealt with, covered by the media, how they have to come to deals with the media, logic. Mm? Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, the American political campaign, election campaign is highly mediatized. Nobody mm -hmm. says uh, or uses this expression, mm -hmm. but uh, we thought that it was a good way of uh, explaining, you know, the, the differences uh, for uh, the American system, uh, the American mediatization, mm -hmm. and see how it applied to what was going on, not only in Italy, because also around Europe there was uh, more regulated maybe, but there was a, the, a tendency to uh, rely more and more on, uh, on the media for for political campaigns. As I said, in the old days, in what uh, Blumler and, and uh, Kavanaugh uh, called the first stage of political communication when television was not around, uh, the election um, battle was based on ideas, ideologies, and on social cleavages and political cleavages. In the second age, when television comes, and especially when commercial television comes, independent television comes, well, uh, the, mm -hmm. the political logics of the past started to, 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 to be uh, shaken up, and, and so other logi logics were entering into the, in, into the landscape. Mm -hmm. Well, now, if you, if you think that the politicians have to adapt themselves, uh, that's already a kind of a revolution because they used to, to, uh, to manage and govern uh, the communication themselves before. Mm -hmm. Now they have to come to terms with the media and the media have different logics than, uh, than politicians. Mm -hmm. so, so you said that you sort of ad adapted um, the concept of media logic from a North Am American yeah. context and applied it to the Italian uh, context because you Perfect. saw something new Perfect. that was happening, yeah, yeah. happening in Italy in, in the 1980s. And it was, um, and one of the factors was the commercialization um, of television and, and, yes. and the very unregulated way that it happened in, in the Italian case. Does that mean that mediatization, it just in terms of the history of mediatization, does that mean that it happens at different times in different places? Does that, does that mean that you know, the United States led the way and it was, you know, I don't know, guess followed by the UK because in the UK we had commercial TV in the 1950s? You know, is, is it, you know, how, how do we think about the history of, of mediatization? Well, it was a sort of a sequential order. I mean, not necessarily uh, the American mediatization uh, impacted directly or was intentionally diffused to, to, to uh, update or to renovate or to modernize uh, election campaigns around, at least not in, uh, in, in the continental Europe or, or in, in the established democracies. That happened later. When uh, the Berlin Wall fell, and so the new democracies were coming up, uh, so the Americans, yeah, in that case, they they sent their own uh, teams to teach how to you know run a campaign using the media, having media experts, uh, uh, con con consultants, and so on. Uh, in Europe, it became it became in in Western Europe, let's say, you know, for to be short. Uh, in France, in Germany, uh, in Italy, and in Britain, uh, with differences, of course, you know, it was everywhere the same, uh, the same phenomenon. But there were many similarities. Uh, uh, what happened in these countries is that, you know, since the media became more and more powerful and more and more independent uh, from uh, uh, politicians, like in Italy, for instance, you know, before the arrival of commercial television, television was a monopoly by the state, so it was heavily controlled by the state. It's still, you know, kind of controlled by the state, public service broadcasting. Mm -hmm. So commercial television was something so independent and uncontrollable, mm -hmm. uh, in a way, that politicians um, were very worried about. And so the Berlusconi phenomenon uh, mm -hmm. comes up exactly in, in, a, in a context like this, you know, where 
commercial television became powerful, it, was, it became itself a player, a political player, and you know, uh, its owner, not by chance, stepped into the political fray and became himself uh, a politician using his own three big national networks. Of course, that didn't happen in Germany, that didn't happen in France, uh, and that didn't happen in, in the UK. But uh, apart from the specificities of the Italian case, uh, we, we can say that uh, in the other uh, democracies, uh, there was a, um, a, 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 a keener attention by politicians, candidates, uh, uh, officials uh, for mm, the um, contribution that the media could bring to their uh, communication. Mm -hmm. uh, the political marketing is something that uh, mm, rises uh, exactly in those years. Mm? Again, you know, it depends from country to country because it depends very much on the, on the uh, electoral system. If the electoral system allows uh, free campaigning or free uses of the media, uh, like uh, in Italy, so the commercials, for instance, uh, the, the political commercials, the election commercials, uh, were a strong, uh, mid, uh, a strong instrument for, uh, for electoral communication. So all these changes, uh, we um, observed these changes in, it in Italy first and then later uh, in, in other countries comparatively, and we looked for you know, the impact, you know, how this changes in the media system and the, in the attitude of political uh, uh, actors towards the media had any implication in terms of, uh, of political communication mm -hmm. and uh, the idea of mediatization has to do with uh, mm -hmm. a, a, an attempt to explain what was changing in, um, in, in the political systems. Mm. So, mediatization basically means that, um, or mediatization of politics basically means that politicians yeah. adapt their behaviour to fit in with the, the rules and conventions of media institutions rather than trying to impose yeah. their control over media institutions. Does that, it, it, do we, do we, do we see that there are differences in different places depending on, say, the strength of public service television mm. in different countries? Are there, are there some countries where, where politicians still have more control over media institutions than Yeah, than there others? are slight differences, I might say. Uh, because um, if, you, if you consider journalism, uh, the, the differences can be uh, uh, substantial from one country to the other. But if you consider the media or the new media, and in terms of you know new television, uh, the color television, um, interactive television, uh, satellite television, you know that was you know between the mid '80s until the mid '90s before uh, the rise of the internet. Uh, in that period, uh, you see many similarities, like you know the personalization of politics. As I said, in the old days. Uh, politicians or political leaders didn't really care much about their own personal image. Nobody knew much about their personal life, or to use uh, a term uh, uh, um, uh, very popular, made very popular by our colleague James Tanya, their intimate life. Uh, nobody knew anything about them. Now, with the spotlights of the media, uh, 24 hours a day, you know, on you politician or would-be political leaders, you know, politicians started to, to care more about their own personal image. And so they had to rely on personal, uh, you say, uh, personal coaches. I mean, they, uh, coaches that they help you how to speak in public, in you know, public speaking, mm -hmm. how to take care of your, uh, of your hair, of your uh, appearances in public. This is one case. So do you think that the media, the media logic, um, commercialization of television, yeah. do you think that drives yeah. political per yeah. personalization yeah. as well? Yeah. 
and also you know the, the BBC itself you know uh, in a way uh, drove towards this sort of personalization without being uh, dedicated to uh, personalized politics but the fact that you had to go uh, to into a show uh, and you had to you know mm -hmm. go the right way and mm -hmm. and so um, uh, this is one example the other example is uh, mm, the uh, the media genia media genic personality mm -hmm. so uh, if you are good looking if you are mm -hmm. a good looking lady uh, if you uh, are very good in cracking jokes, uh, mm. so you are uh, a pleasurable person, you might have more mm. chances to become mm. a successful leader. Mm. Maybe eventually you will be mm. no good in, in the substance, but as far as the image is concerned, you will be a successful leader. Mm. Mm. And that happened maybe not in big cases here and there, even in Germany. You know, some some uh, popular uh, personages uh, could uh, build some ambition to become politicians and they relied on their popularity. Mm. Mm. Okay, so there are many cases, uh, we could stay here for hours to mm. list all of them, how the media change uh, the way politicians interact with their supporters and, and uh, constituencies. You mentioned um, Berlusconi um, earlier on, and, and obviously Berlusconi was an extremely wealthy um, entrepreneur, extremely wealthy businessman. And um, in the aftermath of the crisis of the political system in Italy in the early 90s, Berlusconi yeah. became president uh, of the Council of Ministers, and he obviously own newspapers and television stations and so there seems to be this sort of confluence of of um, of this commercial TV populist populist media with um, a populist politician but uh, would you would you see Berlusconi as as a as a populist politician or is that not really a, a, a concept that's well, probably it's not the, the best example of the populism that we know uh, nowadays. Mm. Uh, but certainly, he uh, played the populist uh, card uh, many times um, in, in his way of you know, appearing in public uh, in uh, things that he used to say about you know, certain uh, domestic issues, you know, poverty or not poverty. Uh, taxes and not taxes. Um, so some of the rhetoric of Berlusconi, as I said, not always, but some of the rhetoric can be uh, can be defined uh, as populist. But probably um, it's not technically, we might say, even though populism is a, a very uh, a very loose concept. With, uh, you know, political scientists are, are still quarrelling about how to define precisely populism. So yeah, we can say that Berlusconi uh, was uh, the early populist uh, um, of Italian modern democracy. Mm. Uh, but you can see and find uh, populism in many other uh, leaders that are not necessarily considered populists. Even in the left-hand side of the political spectrum, many political leaders, you know, uh, strike uh, popular cards uh, in saying that you know uh, the poor should uh, pay less taxes. Uh, it can be considered populist because you you address uh, the popular uh, the popular uh, sentiments there, and you talk directly to them. And of course, the, the intention is to, to attract their support in order to win the election. Mm. Mm. So Berlusconi, going back to Berlusconi, yeah, mm, he was, he, he was um, populist, and, uh, but um, there are other populists uh, who were 24 hours a day populist. Uh, Berlusconi probably was populist a few hours mm. a day, mm. let's put it that way. We, we're living through a sort of a populist moment in, in world politics, um, arguably with Trump and Brexit, 
Um, Modi in India, arguably, is a populist, and there are there, there are a, a number of um, you know European populist parties and movements, left, right, centre, um, and there are lots of people who are starting to write about populism. And um, I guess I, you know, looking back, uh, you've been writing about populism for twenty years, so you're sort of twenty years ahead of the game. <laughs> as it were. And uh, one of the questions that always interested me is why did you actually start writing about media populism? What, what, was, the, what was the motivation behind that? Yeah. Thank you for the question because, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, the book, uh, The Media and Neopopulism, um, was published in 2003. But the research, uh, which is a, comparat a comparison, a comparative research, uh, uh, is, uh, has been done in the turn of the century of the millennium, you know, between 1999 to 2002. Um, um, it was almost, you know, sometimes um, you do research uh, unplanned, you see, wow. This is a nice case to study. Why don't we don't invest some uh, money and some time and some energy to investigate about the? Uh, so in in my case, uh, I had the chance to be invited uh, to the University of Southern Queensland, uh, close to Brisbane, in 1998, and uh, in the, that area, it was very popular and very famous. One lady. Uh, Pauline Hanson, that I didn't know anything about her, you know, coming from Europe, I said, who's she? And I understood that she was, uh, uh, by the way, she's still around, I mean, as a, a, a populist leader in, in, uh, in Canberra, in the parliament there. Um, and she, she led the movement One Nation, that exactly, now I can say from you know, in 2012, uh, 17, that uh, she was using the, the rhetoric and the language that we uh, are uh, hearing and seeing and listening uh, nowadays from the populists around Europe and not only around Europe, even Trump uses the same language, you know, insulting the immigrants, uh, uh, get, get out uh, Australia, Australia is for Australians and so on, that sort mm. of rhetoric sounded very much like uh, my Italian rhetoric of, uh, not mine, of course, but by uh, Umberto Bossi, who was mm, um, going to be one of the allies of Berlusconi later on. And uh, the Northern League in Italy was the first uh, movement uh, in Italy to, to be uh, what we can say now, uh, use the, using the word now, uh, a populist uh, movement against immigrants, uh, xenophobia, um, jobs to Italians and so on, even a secession. They wanted to cut Italy, you know, the northern Italy, a um, mm. wealthier uh, part of Italy, uh, to cut it from, uh, from the, the south, center and center part of Italy because they were considered uh, exploiting the, the tax money, uh, uh, the money of the taxpayers or the not. So things that you can today here in the Catalonian case, for instance. Mm. Mm. So in those days, nobody, were re nobody was really uh, um, caring about uh, these issues. You know, it was you know, kind of folkloristic movement in Australia as it was in Italy. So we decided uh, at the university there to, to do some comparison, you know, not only uh, of the two different systems, completely different systems, but see how uh, politicians spoke. So the language of these politicians, why it was so similar. Mm. The language and then the, 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 the care of the personality, again, you know, that has to do with mediatization. That's mm. why the, the things are very well connected. But eventually we said, well, I mean, to write a book or on two uh, minority, uh, minoritarian figures like Pauline Hanson and Umberto Bossi around the world, nobody will care. So we enlarged the spectrum, so we included Latin America, uh, the US, you know, the Rospero movement, uh, France, because the Front National was there since uh, 
20 or 30 years. Uh, so it was a big thing, not as big as now, but it was already present and, uh, and influential. And then Austria, it was uh, um, Heiders. Uh, they, those were the Heiders uh, days. So he was very popular in Austria. So we noticed that around the world, and also India, by the way, you know, the, 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 the uh, Hindu party, the BHP, if I am not wrong, the, the, um, the party of, of the present prime minister, Mm. which was very much against the Muslim, of course, uh, very much against those who were not Indians. So, you know, mm. there was a commonality of uh, rhetoric. And we investigated not so much the populism uh, characteristics that was not part of our uh, um, uh, competences because we were not political scientists, we were communication scientists. So we studied how the media intervened in all this. And so we made this, a comparative study um, looking at the role and impact of the media in, uh, in the rise and in the development in the, and also in the um, decline uh, of these movements. And we came up with, uh, you know, a, the four phases, you know, the, the, the ground, lay, ground uh, lane phase when, you know, the, the media diffuse a climate of opinion like um, emphasizing that the rape was, uh, uh, was made by a, an immigrant. So, you know, you bombard people year after year, you sort of um, diffuse a, a, a sense of uh, insecurity and also of um, uh, of hostility towards those who are not uh, Australian, who are not Italians. So that ground laying is very much based on, on the action of the media. And then there was the insurgent when the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the movements come up and the leaders become popular because uh, also they rely on the media. Because if they don't rely on the media, they will continue not to be unknown, to be, uh, they will never become popular. Mm? Mm. And then there is also the established phase when some of these movements uh, uh, entered into co governing coalitions, even like in Austria, like in, uh, even in, uh, in Australia. Mm. And, uh, and we observed that uh, uh, in that case, the media became more careful. Mm -hmm. and judging the performance of the populist movement. So they, were, they become more critical. If in the previous two phases they were intentionally or unintentionally most of the time uh, supporting uh, the, the populist uh, leaders and movements, uh, eventually they become a bit uh, critical and so sometimes they thumb down mm -hmm. the ways they conduct uh, uh, government or um, government policies and so on. And then we also observed how the media sometimes accompany a movement to fade out and to disappear because uh, scandals like it happened in Sweden uh, a few years ago. And you know, there were two leaders who fought each other all the, all the way through. And so they, they uh, really destroyed their own movement. And the media, you know, pumped into that because it was, you know, funny to see two so there are many cases that uh, uh, we studied. So we came out with the book in 2003, and then it was ignored for maybe at least 10 years. And then all of a sudden, uh, our book started to <laughs> become mm -hmm. popular and being bought and read uh, by almost all the, the, the students of uh, political communication and those who were interested in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in populism. And they, of course, they developed, there are groups uh, that have developed and they came out, came out with beautiful new studies about the role of the media, more sophisticated yeah. than ours. Could I ask a question about um, the issue of, of intentionality and, 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 and whether media institutions intentionally or unintentionally support populism because it, it, it's, it strikes me that um, in the countries that I know about um, most of the mainstream media both both elite and popular media are actually very critical of populists so um, there's a great deal of criticism of UKIP and Farage in the UK Front National is heavily criticised by mainstream media in France. Alternativa for Deutschland is criticised by 
most mainstream or virtually all mainstream media in Germany, in the States, you know, Fox supports um, Trump, but that's only one network, not only one network and, you know, so a, a lot of the mainstream media would actually distance themselves from populist figures, but that doesn't seem to matter very much. You know, populists become popular, you know, irrespective of what the, what the media say. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the hypotheses uh, that we discussed. Uh, even though in the cases that we um, compare, the eight cases that are in our book, for instance, in the early study that we uh, conducted, um, we observed that uh, 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 most of the tabloids were unintentionally bringing water to the mills of uh, the movement uh, that would maybe later uh, uh, rise uh, uh, by, as I said before, uh, telling stories that were not, were not necessarily populist, uh, but uh, uh, that had to do with um, diffused insecurity. Uh, someone later would exploit these stories that didn't have anything to do uh, with uh, uh, pushing for a populist uh, response. Uh, uh, some smart and clever populists, and most of these people are smart and clever and media savvy, by the way, uh, exploited the CC. Uh, look at the chronicle, you know, what happens every day in our, in our uh, um, inner cities or uh, um, uh, around the country. So why is that? Uh, because our leaders in our capital, in London or uh, in Canberra or in Sydney or in Rome, uh, don't care much about the needs of the population, so the poor people. So that sort of, you know, uh, um, um, realization, awareness uh, um, was uh, triggered by the leaders, by it was already there, uh, created unintentionally because, you know, the media did their job, especially if they were um, um, tabloid, they had to emphasize stories, you know, to be sensational, to exaggerate. Uh, um, and that's, as I said, their job, uh, they make money out of it. Mm? So that's the unintentional support uh, that uh, we saw in our cases uh, that the uh, leaders later on would exploit to, to, you know, to, to make their uh, movement um, successful, electorally speaking. And of course, there are also uh, some intentional cases, like in the Austrian case, uh, the Kronen Zeitung, which is the most important uh, um, tabloid in Austria, was openly mm -hmm. supporting. Uh, so there was a political bias there. So they were really bringing uh, support to the FPÖ, uh, the, uh, the, the Populist Party, of uh, Jörg Haider. So, but, that, but those were uh, few cases. It, it, we couldn't generalize that all uh, the, the, um, the tabloids and the commercial newspapers uh, that did their job just for profit uh, were working for the, the populist leaders. Some did, some did. Maybe in the Brexit case, uh, most uh, before, uh, before Brexit and during the Brexit, uh, maybe not afterwards, but before, looking at the, at the titles, uh, the headlines uh, of the newspapers, uh, um, you could see how most of the uh, tabloids, British tabloids, were mu very much in favor of Brexit. Mm? In that case, there's an, an intentional an intentional um, action to uh, to bring support to uh, to the movement uh, of uh, leave mm? Mm -hmm. and not to remain. Very few were uh, for remain. Maybe the established newspaper, the mainstream newspapers, they were for remain. Not all of them, but most of them in, in the British case. 
So mm, the intentionality or an intentionality depends from case to case, but uh, you, it's a good way of distinguishing how at what extent the media can uh, uh, be supportive uh, to any political movement. We are studying uh, populist movements, so we, we spoke in terms of populism, but it can be applied also to other, to other uh, movements which are not necessarily populist. One of the things that you've been doing over the last few years is to edit the Encyclopedia of Political Communication, which is a, a large three-volume um, account of, of what political communication is um, internationally. So I thought I'd take this opportunity of asking you where, where, where you think the big questions lie um, for future research for political communication scholars. What, what should, we, what should we, th we be thinking about? My easiest uh, answer in this case, because it's a big question, it would take <laughs> the whole afternoon maybe to respond to, to your question, would be to uh, suggest uh, the would-be readers of the encyclopedia to read the entry by Jay Blomler, Political Communication. He nicely and clearly lists um, you know, the, the, the issues, the, the, the critical issues of political communication today. But, you know, you can, uh, it depends on the, um, the, the, the scholarship that you are more familiar with, uh, because the encyclopedia is, uh, by definition, uh, multidisciplinary. So there is psychology, there is linguistics, uh, philosophy, uh, sociology, political science. So if you are a linguist, probably, uh, you would answer to your question, uh, I would answer to your question in a different way. As, you know, sociologists uh, observing the phenomenon of politics uh, uh, interacting with the media or with communication and vice versa, I would say that, um, uh, I must say that uh, I'm not uh, being original here because uh, everybody is doing, uh, is doing it now. Uh, the new media, you know, the digitalization of society and politics, uh, it's a big, uh, very big, very big challenge and a very big uh, um, message to, uh, to uh, scholarly research to investigate more deeply. Um, what are the implications of digitization uh, for politics? As the mass communication created you know, what we called mediatization because they were changing, the politics was changing vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the mass media. Is politics changing and to what extent? And what are the implications? What, is, what are the effects of uh, the encounter uh, of um, politics and political reality, political uh, action and political leaders, uh, the encounter with the, with the digital media? which are not only the social media, which mm. are a big part, uh, but also with the, uh, yeah, digitization is really changing, has changed already our private life, for instance. Mm. So do you, politics, think it, do you think it changes populism? Do you think it changes the but way also, that in a way, yeah, of course, because in the old days, you know, when we studied populism in the early days, uh, the diffusion was uh, uh, made by television, maybe indirectly or unintentionally, and it was quite quite effective. But now uh, it took some time before you know um, uh, gathering crowds uh, around you. Now with social media, we know very well, you know, you can mobilize uh, millions of people potentially, of course, not necessarily on all issues you. Uh, mobilize a million millions of people, but um, that possibility uh, that empowers very much, very much uh, people, and uh, politicians exploit the empowerment of people. Well, um, it's a completely new landscape, mm. something that has to be uh, discovered and uh, studied and uh, with much curiosity. Mm. So. Um, so, so, so what do you think about the, the argument that 
um, the sort of new populists or neo neo populists are starting to use social media to promote themselves and and their movements independently of of the the mass media or the mainstream mm -hmm. media and, it's, and, yeah, and, and intermediation and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah and this creates a more yeah. sort of volatile do, do you do you support that argument or, or do you see it as being is it strong or is it flawed or what are the limits to that well, there isn't much uh, empirical research on that, I must say. Mm. So uh, that's one of the that could uh, be a question. one of the fields. <laughs> yeah, one of the fields where uh, we should put more energy in uh, in uh, in discovering um, how it works. You know what happens. What happens with the media uh, or the social media used by by political uh, uh, populist leaders. Uh, but we don't know. We don't know much about. But but um, I think I think this is my opinion. So it has to be you know uh, verified uh, by more empirical research. I uh, think that the uh, populist leaders can gain a lot from this, but they also risk a lot uh, because uh, the climates of opinion nowadays change really overnight. Sometimes it might happen because of a terrorist attack, for instance, you know, unplanned and, and unexpected. Uh, it might happen because uh, yeah, one of the leaders has been uh, shot or killed, or like in the Austrian case, you know, Haider died in a car accident. Mm. So his movement almost fell apart, for instance, you know. So these cases um, can change uh, can change uh, very quickly uh, the situation. So the new media are a big, a, a strong instrument for diffusion of your creed, of your uh, message to thousands and million people. Uh, but at the same time, the, it can be turned against you by other movements. So there is the possibility by other movements to use the same instrument to uh, to uh, to contain you or even to destroy you, political uh, and populist leader. So it's um, you say double double edged double edged uh, yeah double edged um, sort of uh, sort of weapon. Uh, but it's a weapon. It's a weapon. It is uh, now commonly used by all. By I must say even by Angela Merkel. Maybe not herself directly, mm -hmm. but. Her uh, advisors uh, use uh, uh, use uh, the social media to, to uh, well to support her agenda or to show that she is also smiling. Mm, uh, she doesn't tweet at three o'clock no, in the morning. No, I don't probably think, not. I don't yeah, think I, she I, does. I, uh, maybe she does, but uh, no. <laughs> we never saw any picture. It would be viral, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jan Petra, it's been um, great to talk to you. Uh, hear about your insights into contemporary um, political communication scene, but also to find out more about your intellectual biography. And, and um, once again, thank you very much for coming to Loughborough. It's been a pleasure to have you here at the Institute for Advanced Studies. Thank you for giving me the opportunity and also the honor of being here for the, uh, the uh, Institute of Advanced Studies at the University of Loughborough. Thank you. <laughs>